Before I begin, we're going to be, uh, turn to, please turn to Acts chapter 6 and chapter 8. You can just kind of put your finger there. But uh, something that was kind of touching to me on our trip to Israel is there was a gentleman uh, from one of the other churches, his name was George, uh, who was a veteran. He, he, wore, uh, he served in the armor, but he wore a hat for his son who served on the USS Wisconsin. Uh, something that was really kind of touching to me is that as we were going through the old quarter, uh, there were some IDF soldiers standing there kind of keeping an eye on things and keeping us safe. George went up and up to the soldiers and thanked them for their service and for protecting us. A couple days later, uh, we were in an area near where they say that the upper room was, um, and George was sitting down, and yeah, I agree, it, it was not the upper room, but uh, George was sitting down and a young Jewish boy comes up to him and said, Sir, did you serve in the U.S. military? He goes, I'm from Chicago, and I just want to thank you for your service for our country. So he was a Jewish young man who was there for school or something like that, so it was nice to see how the Lord kind of turned that around. Um, uh, many of us as Christians desire to be used by the Lord and want to be led by him in our lives. We may look to men like Franklin Graham and Billy Graham and marvel at how they've been used by the Lord to bring countless people to the foot of the cross of, of Jesus Christ. We may look to the apostles and how the Holy Spirit moved mightily through them, through their lives, and desire that type of fruit in our lives. We may get frustrated, though, with God as we're facing a trial and wondering why he isn't showing us his full plan or why we aren't seeing more of him at work in our lives. It's important to remember that as it's written in his word in Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 10, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. God knows the end from the beginning, since he is outside of time. And he will always reveal his plan to us, but in his time. And he's only going to reveal what he wants us to know. One step at a time. As we're obedient to the first step, at times he'll reveal the second. When we obey that, then maybe the third. And we don't know how many steps might be involved in what he's got planned for us. This morning, though, we're going to be looking at Philip and the steps of obedience that led to his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. So we're going to read now Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. And then we're going to turn to chapter 8 and read verses 1 to 8, 12 and 13, and then 26 to 40. We're then going to go back and then we'll look at Philip's life. We'll see how these seven steps of obedience led to Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. So let's pray. Father, we just come before you once again with praise and thanksgiving for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are at work in our lives and that you are drawing all men and women to yourself. We thank you for your word a lamp to our feet, and a light to our path. We thank you that your word is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword that can discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I pray, Father, that you would uh, speak through me now, that the message spoken would be your words and not mine, that this would be something that would be edifying and pleasing to you. And we thank you and we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. 
Then the word of the Lord, then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now we'll read chapter 8, those selected verses. Now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking of Stephen. At that time, excuse me, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to meet him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, let's, uh, we're going to turn back to chapter 6 now, and we're going to kind of look at a little bit about Philip. There's some things in chapter 6 that we can learn about who Philip was. First, we know that Philip was a Gentile. We see him mentioned after a dispute arose in the early church, which was primarily Jewish. In verse 1, it talks about there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. The early church was, was Jewish. Um, and then after Jesus gave Peter the vision of the sheet coming down, where Peter had said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Jesus used that to show him to go to uh, the centurion's house to let him know that the door was going to be open to the Gentiles. So the Hellenists would have been the Greeks. 
and they were upset because they felt that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The disciples then said it's not desirable that they should be pulled away from the teaching of the word in prayer to serve tables. So therefore, they said to seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. That's the next thing we see about Stephen, that he was a man of good reputation. The King James Version translates this of honest report. The word in the Greek for that is martyreo, which is where we get the word martyr from. And a lot of times we just view that as a person who gives their life for the Lord and ending in death. Well, that's what our lives should be, is that we should be giving our lives to the Lord and being those living epistles for him. The other thing that we can see in verse 3 about Philip is that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Philip was filled with the Holy Spirit by just serving tables and widows? I thought the gifts of the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12, were prophecy, interpretation, words of faith, words of knowledge, faith, working of miracles, speaking in tongues, love, etc. Yes, a person can be filled with the Holy Spirit while serving tables or serving coffee or setting up chairs, teaching, whatever it might be. Just jot these verses down because I'll read them to you. Uh, this is where Moses described the artisans who were involved in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant and the Articles for the Priests. This would be in uh, Exodus 28, verse 3, 31, verse 3, and 35, verse 31. Exodus 28, verse 3 reads, So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. Um, I'll read Exodus 31, verses 2 to 5. And this same passage, I'm not going to read it again, is repeated in Exodus 35, verses 30 to 33. See, I have called by name Beziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels, for setting and carving wood into all manner of workmanship. So the first step in Philip's life after he put his trust in Jesus was that he was serving and he was ministering. There is no such thing as a small ministry to the Lord. Please don't view ministry as what Pastor Phil or Pastor Zach do every Sunday, teaching and leading in worship. Any ministry that's done to honor Jesus is important. Jesus even said, if you give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in my name, you will receive a prophet's reward. Um, there was a time, I think it was Pastor Dave Hawking, a Calvary pastor, who wondered in his church about something small. That every Sunday he came in and they had pencils on the back of the pews and was wondering, how were these pencils sharp every week? So one night... He kind of came in late to the church, kind of snuck in quietly and just hung out there. And I don't know about what time it was, but the door opened. And he saw a man who came in very quietly, nonchalantly. No one knew. There wasn't a big sign, a big fanfare, fireworks, or, hey, check me out. But this man very diligently every week went through the church and sharpened all the pencils. It was a ministry to the Lord. Now, sometimes we think, some people think, hey, I'm called to minister. I'm called to be a minister. And it reminds me of a story that Pastor Chuck shared, that he would get young men that would come to him and say, Pastor Chuck, I feel that God is calling me to the ministry. He would say, okay, go talk to Pastor Romaine. So these guys would go talk to Romaine and say, Romaine, I believe that God has called me to be a minister here. I'm available to teach next Sunday. And, and Romaine would go, here's a mop and a plunger, the bathroom needs to be cleaned. So please, when, when, you, when you're faithful in that service, then the Lord will raise you up and bring you to, to another ministry. So be faithful to where the Lord has called you. You may be serving in a fashion that no one sees you, but that's okay. If you're doing it for Jesus, he does. And sometimes when we get, when we get to heaven, 
the Franklin or Billy Grahams who we think might be most rewarded may be near the back of the line and it might be a, a saint who was a prayer warrior who might be at the front. Now we're going to turn to chapter 8 and we're going to take another look at Philip. We're going to read verses uh, 1 to 8 again and verses 12 to 13. And the next step of obedience we're going to see in verses 5 to 8 and then 12 and 13. Now Saul was consenting to his death, once again talking about when Stephen was martyred for the faith. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame and were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles which were done. This next step, what happened was when, um, after Saul began persecuting the church, the disciples had to flee Jerusalem for their lives. Um, Saul was murdering people. And later on in Acts chapter 9, we see where the Lord got a hold of his heart. However, because of this, this was kind of a fulfillment of God's plan and desire to get the gospel out to the uttermost ends of the earth. Um, we see this as a promise, too, when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God was also confirming Philip's ministry through the working of miracles and signs. How are we impacting our Jerusalem, our family, our neighborhood, our places of employment, our Judea, those areas a little bit further out, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Philip was ministering in an area where he lived. Now let's skip down to verse 26, and we're going to reread verse 26 into 27. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. What we see here is that when Philip went down, that the angel sent, uh, the Lord sent an angel to him, or a messenger telling him to leave Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem, and go to Gaza, which is south near the Mediterranean, near Egypt. And the next step was when the Lord told Philip to do something. He obeyed without argument or question. He obeyed immediately. If the Lord is speaking to you about something, if there is a delay in obedience, that's the same as disobedience. If there's partial obedience, like what happened with Abram, that is disobedience. So if God is speaking to you about something, or me, we need to make sure that we're obedient right away. And actually, this is something the Lord had just spoken to me about recently. I felt the Lord was putting on my heart that there was a change coming in my life. And um, as I was praying about it and asking him what he wanted me to do, he was telling me to leave a place and go. He wasn't showing me where. Okay, what do you want me to do? And he just re really began to convict my heart that a delay in obedience is the same as disobedience. When God tells us to do something, we need to act immediately. Okay? He will work things out perfectly in his time. And as we continue to read on about the Ethiopian eunuch, it says, Scripture says that he was a man of great authority. 
under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This means that he was a prince or a very high-ranking official um, and that he was in charge over all her treasury. So obviously he was a man who was trust, trustworthy and trusted to be able to be in this position. He was in Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel, which we'll start now with verse 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? Basically, Philip was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in his life. How do we put ourselves in a place to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit? We need to be spending time with the Lord in his word and in prayer. There are many things in life that are vying for our attention. The pursuits of a job, maybe our favorite football team or hockey team or something like that, um, but these are a lot of things vying for our attention, trying to draw us away from that intimate fellowship with the Lord. Maybe there's, maybe there's a place in your life right now where the voice of God has gone kind of quiet. Well, we need to get back to a place that we can focus on him, that we can hear his still small voice as he spoke to Elijah, as we cultivate our relationship with him. So far, the steps that we've seen of obedience through Philip's life that he was serving in ministry, he was impacting where he was living, he was obeying the Lord and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And now as we read on, we're going to read through about verse 34 uh, where he meets the eunuch. And actually, um, start back up in verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? The next uh, thing that we see that Philip did was that he asked the eunuch a question. When he heard where he was reading, do you understand what you're reading? And as it talked about that he was reading from the book of Isaiah. He was reading from Isaiah 53, which we'll turn there in a second and we'll take a quick look at that because this is a, a key passage in the Old Testament pointing to the fact that Jesus was the promised ful Messiah fulfilling the promises to the nation of Israel. Sometimes when we're tr trying to witness to someone, asking questions might be a good way to go. If you ask Mo or Giovanni or Teresa or anyone else that's gone out with the evangelism ministry, sometimes those questions spark more questions in return. And it kind of helps disarm people instead of, there have been times when we've gone out, hey, can we talk to you about, do you ever think about spiritual things? And you see the walls, the curtains come down, the walls go up, and they, they tune you out. Um, but sometimes doing this, and even the Ethiop Ethiopian eunuch asked, as he was reading, who does this passage speak of, the prophet or someone else? Well, let's turn to Isaiah 53 real quick, and let's just take a look at that. All right, Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him." He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he has numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made the intercession for the transgressors. So that's a pretty powerful passage where the, where the eunuch was reading. Um, and as we read, let's read back up and we'll go read verse 34 and 35 now. And it's so much, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. So the next thing that we see in Philip's life was that Philip knew God's word. During this time, what we call the New Testament was not written yet but it was in the process of being written. Yet Philip knew the Bible well enough to begin at this scripture and preach Jesus to the eunuch. What he was preaching from was from the Jewish Old Testament. They would call it the Tanakh, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And the word preach here in the Greek is yolangelizo. Sound familiar? It's where we get our word evangelize from, which means to bring good news or to announce glad tidings. So at this point, Philip evangelized the Ethiopian eunuch and shared with him how Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried, and rose again from the dead. Pretty powerful scripture for the eunuch to be reading from. Now, what's interesting is um, the Bible that Philip had, like I said, would have been the Old Testament. The Jews, as they read through the scriptures every year, they start in a, around September, and they will read through the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then they will also have other readings, and they'll read a small portion a day over the course of the year. They will also read something called the Half Torah, which may, might be readings from some of the prophets or Samuel or something like that. They don't read the whole thing, so they don't read the whole Old Testament. But what's interesting about their Half Torah readings is they will have Isaiah 50, 51, 52, Skip, 54. So they don't even read this passage, unfortunately, you know, which if they did, I imagine their eyes might be open to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and what, what Philip had shared with the eunuch about Jesus being crucified, how he was buried and rose again, is what Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, although it wasn't written yet. And we need to know the Bible so well that we could share Jesus this way. And some of you may be sitting here today thinking that, you know what, I don't know the Bible that well, or I'm new to the faith. Um, but you could begin to, I couldn't preach Jesus from a single scripture. Well, let me encourage you, don't be afraid of that. And don't be afraid to share your faith because of what you think might be a lack of knowledge. Share what you know. The Holy Spirit can bring to mind while you are talking to that person maybe other scriptures that you might know. Um, even if the only verse in the Bible you know is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, God can use that to touch another person. Please remember that his word will not return void. Now let's finish the chapter and let's go back to verse 37. Uh, we'll back up, I'm sorry, to verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. 
And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The last step after the eunuch was explained the gospel, he surrendered his life to the Lord and was saved. The path to salvation is simple. There is nothing that we have to do to earn eternal life. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The Lord used Philip to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to eternal life with Jesus that day, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. How many of us now are grateful that we've accepted that gift and can go rejoicing after what he's done for us? As Acts chapter 8 concludes, with the Holy Spirit uh, having caught Philip away, this was kind of interesting when I was preparing for this, that the word caught up in the Greek is harpazo, which means to seize or to carry off by force, to claim for one's own self eagerly, to snatch out or away. This is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, a passage that talks about the rapture of the church. And it was interesting, we kind of sang a song about that today, that the trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to be with the Lord in heaven. And I'm going to like to read this real quick, because... Uh, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And aren't those words a comfort? That someday we're going home and we're going to be with Jesus forever. One final footnote about Philip and his family as we wrap up is that after the Philip left the Ethiopian eunuch, he passed through Azotus, which is actually the city of Ashdod. Because as I'm reading, I'm like, Azotus? I've never heard of this place. But it's actually Ashdod, which is in Gaza, an area that's controlled by the Palestinians today. It's on the Mediterranean coast, and basically after Philip left, he went through Ashdod, proceeded up the coast to where Caesarea was, which is on the north, which is where Herod had his palace, one of his palaces. Something interesting that we read about Philip as we kind of wrap things up in Acts 21, verses 8 to 9. On that day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Philip's faith and trust in the Lord was passed on to his children. We don't know about any sons, but at least there were four daughters that talked about that were filled with the Holy Spirit and were prophesying and proclaiming forth God's word. So parents, allow me to use that to encourage you. If you have children that aren't walking with the Lord, be diligent and faithful in honoring and teaching the word in your home. His word will not return void. Okay? At some point, that may be caught by, by your children. In conclusion... Philip, we see, was a man who had a good reputation and filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that that would be said of us. Like I said, the word was martyr, and we usually think of that as someone who's lived their life to the point of death. May we truly live that way in our own lives, that we would be those living epistles again. That Philip served in ministry, he ministered to his community, he obeyed the Lord immediately, he was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, he asked questions, he knew the scriptures, and he was used to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to saving faith in Jesus. May we desire and apply these traits and steps to our own lives. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you uh, for this lesson of Philip the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch, Lord. We thank you how your spirit was mightily upon him and all that he did, and pray that it would be true of us in our day. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, go before us now that you would give us opportunities this week to tell others about you, and that you would give us the love and the boldness to share you with them. 
We thank you and commit this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen.